the first Sunday after Trinity, O oh God, the strength of all those who put their trust in thee, mercifully accept our prayers because through the weakness of our mortal nature, we can do no good thing without thee. Grant us the help of thy grace that in keeping thy commandments we may please thee, both in will and in deed, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Verse 3 of Hymn 170, is still in Holy Week. A scepter read, O patient Lord, they thrust into your hand and acted out their grim charade to the appointed end. But they did not know, as we do now, though empires rise and fall, the kingdom shall not cease to grow till love embraces all. Clearly not a reformed writer. In no sense, we're still looking for atonement. Um, we're now with Mr. Froud, who this may be the violent man who hates reformed theology. We'll see. It was published in 1871, given to an audience at St. Andrews, where he was the alleged rector. Let's see here. Gentlemen, this is my grand. Well, I'm unwilling to allow the temporary connection between us to come to an end without once more addressing you. I find it difficult to select the subject on which it may be worth your while to listen to what I have to say. You know yourselves better than I can tell you the purposes for which you have assembled in this place. Many of you will have formed honorable resolutions to equip yourselves bravely and manfully both in your term of preparation here and in the life which you are about to enter. Resolutions which would make exhortations of mine to you to persevere appear unmeaning and almost impertinent. You are conscious in detail of the aims which you've set before yourselves and perhaps have already chosen the professions which you mean to follow. I have decided due consideration to speak to you things which though not immediately connected with the University of St. Andrews or any other university yet concern all us all the more than any other matter in the world. Blah, blah, blah. I'm about to travel over serious ground. I shall not trespass on theology, though I must go near the frontiers of it. I should give you the conclusions which I have been led to form upon a spirit a series of spiritual phenomena which have appeared to exercise successfully in different ages, a remarkable influence in the history and character of mankind. Every one of you here must have become have become familiar in late years with the change of tone throughout Europe and America on the subject of Calvinism. After being accepted for two centuries in all Protestant countries as the final account of the relations between man and his maker, it has come to be regarded by liberal thinkers as a system of belief, incredible in itself, dishonoring to its object, and as intolerant as it has been itself, intolerable as it has itself been intolerant. The Catholics whom it overthrew take courage from the philosophers and assail it on the same ground to represent man as sent into the world under a curse as incurably wicked, wicked by the constitution of his flesh and wicked by eternal decree as doomed unless exempted by special grace, which he cannot merit or by any effort of his own obtain <coughs> to live in sin while he remains on earth and to be eternally miserable when he leaves it. To represent him as born unable to keep the commandments, yet is justly liable to everlasting punishment for breaking them, is alike pug repugnant to reason and conscience, and turns existence into a hideous nightmare. To deny the freedom of the will is to make morality impossible. To tell men that they cannot help themselves is to fling them into recklessness and despair. To what purpose the effort of to be virtuous when it is an effort which is foredoomed to fail? 
and those that are saved are saved by no effort of their own and confess themselves the worst of sinners, even when rescued from the penalties of sin. And those that are lost are lost by an everlasting sentence decreed against them. How are we to recall the ruler who laid us under this iron code with the name of wise or just or merciful? when we ascribe principles to him which in a human father we would call preposterous and monstrous. The discussion of these strange questions has been pursued at all times with inevitable passion. And the crisis uniformly has been drawn a drawn battle. The Arminian has tangled the Calvinist. The Calvinist has entangled the Arminian in a labyrinth of contradictions. The advocate of free will appeals to the conscience and instinct, to an a priori sense of what ought inequity to be. And this is necessitarian falls back. Human can gainsay it. That men are placed in the world unequivocally favored, both in inward disposition and outward circumstances. Some children are born with temperaments which make a life of innocence and purity natural and easy to them. Others are born with violent passions or even with distinct tendencies to evil inherited from their ancestors and seemingly unconquerable. Uncon Some are constitutionally brave. Others are constitutionally cowards. Some are born in religious faith of families and are carefully educated and watched over. Others draw their first breath in an atmosphere of crime and cease to inhale it only when they pass into their graves. Only a fourth part of mankind are born Christians. The remainder never hear the name of Christ except as a reproach. The Chinese and Japanese, we almost say every weaker race with whom we have come into contact, connected only with the forced intrusion of strangers whose behavior among them has served ill to recommend their creed. These are facts which no casuistry can explain away. And if we believe at all that the world is governed by a conscious and intelligent being, we must believe also, however, that we can reconcile it with our own ideas, that these anomalies have not risen by accident. No less notable is it that the materialistic and metaphysical philosophers deny as completely as Calvinism what is popularly called free will. Every effect has its cause, and every action the will powerfully upon it. When we do wrong, we are led away by temptation. If we overcome our temptation, we overcome it either because we foresee inconvenient consequences, and the certainty of future pains is stronger than the present pleasure, or else we prefer right to wrong, and our desire for good is greater than our desire for indulgence. Blah, blah, blah. Spinoza, from entirely different premises, came to the same conclusion as if not the pot or power of the clay to make one vessel to honor and another to dishonor. If Arminianism commends itself to our feelings, Calvinism is nearer to the facts, however harsh and forbidding those facts may seem. I have no intention, however, of entangling myself or you in these controversies. As little shall I consider whether men have done wisely in attempting a doctrinal solution of the problems. The moral system of the universe is like a document written in alternate ciphers which change from line to line. We read a sentence, but the next our key fails us. We see that there is something written there, but if we guess at it, we're guessing in the dark. It seems more faithful, more becoming in beings such as we are, to rest in the conviction of our own inadequacy, confine ourselves to those moral rules for our lives and actions. Number one at present, we've got some other point in here. margins here. We're concerned with an aspect of the matter entirely different. I'm going to ask you to consider how it came to pass that if Calvinism is indeed the hard and unreasonable creed which modern enlightenment declares it to be, it has possessed such singular attractions in past times for some of the greatest men that ever lived. Two, 
and how being is we're told fatal to morality because it denies free will. The first symptom of its operation, wherever it established itself, was to obliterate the distinction between sins and crimes and to make the moral law the rule of life for states as well as persons I don't get his point there. I shall ask you again why, if it be a creed of intellectual servitude, it was able to inspire and sustain the bravest efforts ever made by man to break the yoke of unjust authority. When all else has failed, when patriotism has covered its face and human courage broken down, when intellect has yielded, as Gibbon says, with a smile or sigh, content to philosophy, tender, imaginative piety, become the handmaids of superstition, have drunk themselves into forgetfulness. That there is any difference between lies and truth, the slavish form of belief called Calvinism, in one or other of its many forms, has borne an inflexible front to illusion and mendacity and has preferred rather to be ground to powder like flint than to bend before violence or melt under enervating temptation. He's got a point. Calvinists are a strong breed. It is enough to mention the name of William the Silent, Luther. On the points of which I am speaking, Luther was one with Calvin, of your own Knox and Andrew Melville, and Regent Murray of, Co of Colony, our English Cromwell, Milton of John Bunyan. These men were possessed all the qualities which give nobility and grandeur to human nature. Men whose lives were upright as their intellect was commanding, and their public aims untainted with selfishness. Unalterably, just where duty required them to be stern, but with the tenderness of a woman in their hearts. Frank, true, cheerful, humorous, as unlike a sour fanatics as it is possible to imagine anyone, and able in the same, some way to sound the keynote to which every brave, <coughs> faithful heart in Europe instinctively vibrated. This is the problem. Grapes do not grow on bramble bushes. Illustrious natures do not form themselves upon narrow and cruel theories. Spiritual life is full of apparent paradoxes. When St. Patrick preached the gospel on Terra Hill to Laghar, the Irish king, the Druids, and the wise men of Ireland shook their heads. Why, asked the king, does what the cleric preaches seem so dangerous to you? Because, was the remarkable answer, because he preaches repentance. And the law of repentance is such that a man shall say, I may commit a thousand crimes, and if I repent, repent, I shall be forgiven, and it will be no worse with me. Therefore, I will continue to sin. The Druids argue, argue logically, but they drew a false inference notwithstanding. The practical effect of a belief of its soundness, where we find the heroic life appearing as the uniform fruit of a particular mode of opinion, it is childish to argue in the face of the fact that the result ought to have been different. The question which I have proposed, however, admits of a reasonable answer. I must ask you only to accompany me in a somewhat wide circuit in search of it. There seems in the first place to lie in all men in proportion to the strength of their understanding a conviction that there is in all human things a real order and purpose, notwithstanding the chaos at times which they, in which they seem to be involved. Suffering scattered blindly without remedial purpose or retributive propriety, good and evil distributed with the most absolute disregard of moral merit or demerit, enormous crimes perpet perpetrated with impunity, Get to your point that in spite of appearance, there is justice at the heart of them, and that in the working out of the vast drama, justice will assert somehow and somewhere its sovereign right and power. 
the better sorts of persons would find existence altogether unendurable. This is what the Greeks meant by ononke or destiny, which is the, at the bottom no other than moral providence. Prometheus chained in the rock is the counterpart of Job on his dunghill. Torn with unrelaxing agony, the vulture with beak and talons rending at his heart. The titan still defies the tyrant at whose command he suffers, and strong conscious innocence appeals to the eternal Mora, Moira, which will do him right in the end. The Olympian gods were cruel, jealous, capricious, malignant, but beyond and above the Olympian gods lay the silent, brooding, everlasting fate of which the victim and tyrant were alike the instruments which at last, far off after the ages of misery it might be, still before all was over, would vindicate the sovereignty of justice. Full as it may be of contradictions and perplexities, this obscure belief lies at the very core of our spiritual nature. And it is called fate, or it is called predestination, according as it is regarded pantheistically as a necessary condition of the universe is the decree of a self-conscious being. Intimately connected with this belief, and perhaps the fact of which it is the inadequate expression, is the existence in nature of omnipresent organic laws penetrating the material world, penetrating the world of human life and society, which insist on being obeyed in all that we do and handle, which we cannot alter, cannot modify, which will go with us to assist and befriend us if we recognize and comply with them, which inexorably makes them felt in failure and disaster. Large forms, the remotest fiber of human action, a king or parliament enacts a law and we imagine we are creating some new regulation to encounter unprecedented circumstances, the law which applied to these circumstances has its ex in existence independent of us and will enforce either itself, either to reward or punish, as the attitude which we assume towards it is wise or unwise. Our human laws are but the copies, more or less imperfect, sounds very platonic, of the eternal laws, so far as we can read them either succeed and promote our welfare or fail and bring confusion and disaster according as the legislator's insight has detected the true principle. And we're up to page 13 of 60 volumes and this is supposed to be on Calvinism. So one-sixth so far other than a brief page which was a tirade really. Um, basically these 13 and 16 pages is what almost uh, one-fourth of the document. Let's get down to some business here. And these laws are absolute and flexible and irreversible, the steady friends of the wise and good, the eternal enemies of the blockhead and the knave. No pope can dispense with a statute enrolled in the chancery of heaven or popular vote repeal it. The discipline is a stern one. And many a wild endeavor men have made to obtain less hard conditions or imagine them other than they are. They have conceived the rule of the Almighty to be like the rule of one of themselves. They have fancied that they could bribe or appease him, tempt him by penance or pious offering to suspend or turn aside his displeasure. They are asking that his own eternal nature shall become other than it is. One thing only they can do. They for themselves, by changing their own courses, can make the law, which they have broken thence for, forward their friend. Their dispositions, dispositions in nature will revive and become healthy again when they are no longer in opposition to the will of their maker. But the natural action of what we call repentance, but the penalties of the wrongs in the past remain unpeeled. Once more, and it is the most awful feature of our condition. The laws of nature are general and are no respecters of person. 
there has been and there still is a clinging impression that the sufferings of men are the results of their own particular misdeeds and that no one is or can be punished for the faults of others. I shall not dispute about the word punishment. The fathers have eaten sour grapes, said the Jewish proverb, and the children's teeth are set on edge. So said Jewish experience, and Ezekiel answered that these words should no longer be used among them. The soul that sinneth it shall die. Yes, there's a promise that the soul shall be saved. There's no such promise for the body. Certainly we're not getting any Old Testament, New Testament, systematics or church history. We're getting a guy who just sounds more like Marcus Aurelius and the Stoics or Plato. Blah, blah, blah. We're up to page 15, 14 now, 15. Still nothing. 25% of this in. Now the feature which distinguishes man from other animals is that he is able to observe and discover these laws which are of such mighty moment to him and direct his conduct in conformity with them. More subtle may be revealed only by complicated experience. The plainer, more obvious among those especially which are called moral, have been apprehended. I shall now ask the knowledge of them and how is it obtained. Blah, 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 elementary principles of morality. I just, I think I'm gonna have to call it here. We're in. About 28, 30%, and there's still nothing on Calvinism. I guess he's gonna hammer that home at some point. This is certainly not terribly illuminating. 171, go to dark Gethsemane, ye that feel the tempter's power. Your Redeemer's conflict, watch with him one bitter hour. Turn not from his griefs away. Learn of Jesus Christ to pray. Let us pray. Mighty and everlasting God, may all the honor and glory be to you, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. God speak.